Hi, my name is Sarish Sudhakaran and in this video, we'll analyze the cinematography of Hoyte von Hoytema. The goal is to break down his techniques so you have a starting place to learn more about his work. First of all, I find it disturbing when people say Hoytema is an overnight success. He was rejected twice by the Netherlands Film Academy and had to move to the National Film School in Poland. But the problem was nobody spoke English there and he didn't speak Polish. And then he dropped out. From his student film to the mind-blowing scope of Interstellar and Spectre, he has had a long, hard journey. Before I get into his cinematography, there are some curious facts about Hoytema you'll find interesting. For one, though he has only shot about 15 movies, he has used almost every type of camera out there. The Alexa and Red, Airy, Panavision and Aiton Penelope film cameras, and even broadcast cameras, all for feature film work. He has also used most kinds of lenses, from Zeiss Super Speeds to Arri Master Primes to Cooks to Primos to Optimos and even Canon and Mamiya lenses. He has shot in almost every aspect ratio. He has shot in both 35 and 65 mm IMAX film on both Fuji and Kodak stocks, has used translites and front projection, and finally, he is also a member of no less than three cinematography associations the NSC, FSF, and, only a few months ago, the ASC. Hoytema prefers a naturalistic style and doesn't like drawing attention to his lighting. He loves to place his lights outside the staging area and preferably outside the set if he can get away with it. When lighting interiors, he uses HMIs bounced through light grids or full grids through windows. He exposes faces at normal exposure, unlike most other DPs who tend to overexpose the face a bit. He prefers to create mood by slightly underexposing his shot and he loves the texture film grain introduces into the image. His backgrounds are almost always at the same light levels as the faces. He also avoids lighting to a precise contrast ratio. Instead, he lights for key and then decides to fill or not depending on how the scene feels. He typically top or side lights his actors and this is also due to his lighting strategy of having to place sources away from the set. Usually, he bounces or pushes light through, creating large, diffuse sources that play on the overall scene and provide a soft light. The primary concern is mood, whether we're talking about an intimate vampire story, a training ring, or even something as glamorous as a Bond film. His work is not film noir, by which I mean he doesn't like his shadows to go black. He prefers to see detail and texture in the shadows. The extra light he adds is to create interest. For lack of a better word, I'm just going to say it's a kiss of light. He shoots with all kinds of focal lengths, and his favorite for close-ups and mid-shots is the 35mm, which translates to roughly 50mm on a full-frame DSLR. He has even used a 2000mm lens to achieve some stellar results. Normally, he just uses an ND filter. He adds a plus or minus green, CTO or CTB gel to subtly change colors in camera. You can see he tends towards a warmer skin tone most of the time. He also backlights his actors to separate them from the background, but his use of backlight is subtle and not intended to draw attention to itself. It purely serves a functional purpose. Most of the time, his top light also serves as a hair light. He loves to shoot wide open for a shallow depth of field look. It makes focus pulling tougher, but it allows his camera to get more intimate with his actors. In interiors, he tries to shoot at T1.3 or T2, and for the IMAX shots in Interstellar, he shot at about T2.8 to T4 because it gives you a similar shallow depth of field at those levels. On exteriors, he uses grids or the ultra bounce to control lighting, and most times his weapon of choice is the 18K Arimax. He uses more light so he can stay away from the action, yet achieve a soft lighting style. And it allows the actors to improvise and explore the set better. For large sets, he rigs up kinos or LED lights, park hands, and even soft boxes, all controlled by grids or floppies. He maintains interest in the shot through the careful use of negative fill or bounce. When it comes to movement, it's a common misconception he is a handheld kind of cinematographer. He knows when to keep his frames fixed or when to use a dolly. As I've mentioned in other videos in this series, you don't get to work with top demanding directors if you're rigid in your methods. 
Hoytema is a truly modern cinematographer, and he has to rely heavily on his colorist. When he shoots film, he prefers a 4K scan to get the grain structure he wants. When people compare his work in Spectre to Roger Deakins' work in Skyfall, they misunderstand the role of the cinematographer. Hoytema's job is to tell a story, not match the look. To compare the two is like asking Roger Deakins to match Skyfall to Roberto Schaefer's work in Quantum of Souls. Ultimately, it's a director who must be first happy with Hoytema's unique aesthetic. After that, it must survive the cold gaze of the thousands of random eyes that form the huge corporate machine that is a Bond film. The fact that a perfectionist like Christopher Nolan has persisted with him on his next project, Dunkirk, should tell you everything you need to know about the work ethic of Hoyta von Hoytema. I get the impression his career has just moved into fourth gear, and we're going to see great things from him in the future. I hope this brief video makes you curious enough to learn more about the brilliant cinematography of Hoyta von Hoytema. The best way to learn more about him is to watch his movies and from his interviews in the American Cinematographer magazine and elsewhere. If there's a favorite cinematographer whose work you want analyzed, let me know. To see more videos like this one, please subscribe. There are lots more on the way. Bye now.